graphic, isn't it? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Gallipoli Peninsula again. Firstly, Ajabat is the town where we met each other at this noon, and we drove that way. Now we are here. Kaba Tepe means soft ridge. This is agency in your lap, and <coughs> there is one big hill called Chudukbar Hill, main object of Anzacs. In your right, the highest point, red flag on the top. It will be our last stop. On the middle you can see one white memorial and one pine tree. It's Long Pine Memorial and Cemetery. It's somewhere over here. So our tour will be around here, around these areas, nearly 10, 11 different stops you will see in the tour today. Okay. <coughs> First is something about the city Chanakkale, across Ejeabat, city Chanakkale is one of the 81 provinces of Turkey. It's getting its name from a castle. There's a castle in Chanakkale, it's shaped like a bowl inside you doing soup. Chanak means the bowl, kale means castle, bowl, castle, Chanakkale. Opposite another castle standing on the European side, here on the narrow side of Dardanelle, it's named Kilit Bahir Castle. Kilit means key. Bahir means sea, key of sea castle. Both of these castles built there in 1462 by Fatih Sultan Mehmed. He was the conqueror of Istanbul. When he conquered Istanbul in 1453, he ordered his commanders to build these castles by saying, if we want to work in Istanbul, we have to work in Gallipoli. Because famous waterway, the Dardanelles. All around 62 kilometers long. Narrow side 1.2 kilometers, widest part nearly 10 kilometers. Okay, <coughs> as I told, in order to understand the importance of this area during the Great War, we need to go back background of the war. As all you know, in 1940 there was a growing tension between Austria and Serbia, and almost everybody was expecting that. Such a big war will start one day, but when or where exactly no one knows. But all the big states prepared themselves for the war. They were looking for a new Helen to start this war. At that time, who was the Helen of Great War? Ah, that's true, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. When he was assassinated by a Serbish in Bosnia on 28 June 1914, war started. One month later, Austria declared a war to Serbia on 28th of July 1914. At that time, Austria was on the side of Germany. Serbia was on the side of Russia. Russia allied with France and British Empire. At the beginning of this war, big Ottoman Empire, where Turkish people living before Turkish public, chose to be neutral because of bad conditions. Conditions were really bad for Ottomans because in 1911 they fought with Italians and troubles got war for the rich patrol soldiers, lost the war. 1912 they fought with Balkan countries, Bulgaria, Serbia, and Greece, lost the first Balkan war. 1913, second Balkan war started, second time lost. While they were losing these wars, they were losing their soldiers, lands, and of course money. Yes, once upon a time they were controlling three big continents of the world. But nowadays, the name of Ottoman Empire was <coughs> <coughs> the sick man of Europe. So they chose to be neutral at first. But Ottoman Sultan wanted to do something to protect his country from such a big war. So he ordered two big battleships from British Empire and many of these ships paid already. Economic conditions were so bad, many of these ships collected from public. Almost everybody gave some money to purchase these ships. At that time, while majority of Ottoman was trying to be natural, there was a small group. Their names were the Young Turks, and their leader was Enver Pasha. Pasha means general, and he was the second man after Sultan. 
they all trained in Germany, knowing the German technology and support the ideas that we should enter this war on the side of Germany. If we do that, we can get our land back, which we lost during the Balkan Wars. So, Enver Pasha <laughs> supporting these ideas. But the Ottoman government was trying to be away from these wars. But however, Enver Pasha and his group signed an agreement with Germany in 2nd of August 1914. Just two days later, on the 4th of August 1914, British Empire said that we won't give you the two battleships which you paid already. Ottomans asked why we paid for them, waiting for them. But they said if we give you these ships, you can use them against us. So we are keeping them till the war finished. But they are still keeping them. <laughs> I think the war finished night five years ago. <laughs> anyway. After that, Ottoman Empire got angry with the world and they closed the door of Dardanelle to all ships, all battleships. The traffic stopped on the Dardanelle on the 4th of August 1914 for a couple of days. Actually, at that time, almost all the big states around the Ottoman Empire wanted to enter this war. Some of them against them, some of them with them because of geographical <coughs> positions. For example, Germany. Because they declared a war to Russia, to go Russia, German had to use Ottoman seas, Ottoman land, Ottoman straits, and Ottoman soldiers. Ottoman soldiers were nearly all of them were Muslim. The chief of Muslim is Ottoman Sultan. When he called Muslims for fighting, all the Muslims must help Islamic rule the jihad, like pop. So, if you friend with Muslims, they can fight for you. German wants to control these powers. When they heard about that, British Empire kept two Ottoman ships, it became a big chance for the Germans. They immediately sent two German battleships to Turkey. Just six days later, on the 10th of August 1914, these two German battleships, Goblin and Breslau, came to the door of Dardanelles. Normally, no traffic in the Dardanelles, but seeing the two German flag battleships, Ottomans let them to go inside, and they passed the Dardanelles. But Ottomans couldn't notice that these German ships, Goblin and Breslau, while they are coming to Turkey over Mediterranean Sea, they deliberately bombard the British Navy. Now these ships were escaping from the British Navy. And Ottomans took the middle end. After that, Ottoman Empire's neutrality was in question. An Allied asked them, How can you dare to take these ships? You are supposed to be neutral. But Ottomans said, We purchased these ships from Germany instead of two ships which you did not give us. It was a big lie. <laughs> but the name of these German ships changed as Yavuz Midilli. They put them Turkish names and Turkish flags. They either reached Istanbul and joined Ottoman Empire's navy. Six days ago, on the 4th of August 1914, when British Empire said that we won't give it the ships, it became a really big bad command for the British people in Turkey because public paid the ships. But instead of these ships, when Germany sent them two free ships, everybody started to love Germans. But it was the beginning of Germany's big plan. To show sympathy to the Germans, German naval commander Amrath Sushin became the naval commander of Ottoman Navy. Nearly six weeks later, on 28th of September 1914, these two German battleships, or new Ottoman battleships, went to Black Sea for training under the command of Amr Sushin. But when these ships went there, they bombarded Sevastopol, Narozovsky and Odessa harbors in Russia. All the crew and the captain were German, not that. Amr Sushin was commanding them. But the flags and the uniform of the soldiers were Turkish. <laughs> Seeing that, two Turkish flag battleship bombing Russian coast, they thought Ottoman Empire declared war to Russia. But the Ottoman government trying to understand what's been happening there. They sent the ships for training, but no one would believe them. After that, even Ottoman Empire automatically entered the war. At that time, the only friends were Germans. So on the side of Germany, on the side of Central Powers, instead of your side, on the Allied side. And Ottoman Empire began to wait that one day the other two Allied would bomb them. Russia allied with France and British Empire. When you bomb one of these, it means you bombed all of these. So just five days later, 
on the 3rd of November 1914, Allied had the first bombardment on the door of Gallipoli Peninsula and the Gallipoli campaign started. After the bombardment, it understood that one day Allied would try to pass the Dardanelles to reach <coughs> Istanbul. Why Istanbul? Please think, you want to kill someone. There are only two easiest ways to do that. One is to shoot him from head, the other is from heart. At that time, Istanbul was the capital city of Ottomans of both brain and heart of it. If you capture Istanbul, you can easily force the Ottoman Empire out of war and help Russia. What is the easiest way to go to Istanbul? 62 kilometers long, Dardanelles. If you have an unbeatable fleet, if you know the Dardanelles very well, and if you know that your opponents were the sick men of Europe, with a good plan you can easily pass straight, reach Istanbul and capture it. Ottomans were awaiting that, also allies were knowing that, so they did some things to protect and prepare themselves for the big fight. They put their defense there mainly in these areas, because of narrows, castles and Turkish cannons range. They were approximately 12 kilometers, maximum 16 kilometers. But allied cannons range were approximately 16, maximum 18, 19 kilometers. It means in some way 5-6 kilometer distance is a great distance in the war. In the battle, sometimes only 3 centimeters can change the fate of war. For example, please remember, during the Second World War, when the German troops came to Russia, they couldn't go forward. Do you know why? Because... No. Sorry? No. Not snow. <laughs> because... Sorry? No, not the reason. The, the reason was German railways three centimeter thicker than Russian railways. While they waiting there, Russia called a big army, started a big attack, and they captured Berlin. Most of the Berlin because three centimeter. Imagine, please, we talk about five centimeter distance. Anyway, Thomas put lots of mobile artilleries on that side of Dardanelles and that side of the Dardanelles and 10 wine lines. Can you see the white ones from here, start from here to here? These are the 10 mine lines. Nearly 270 pieces of German made mines. Germany sent some commanders, some German commanders and <coughs> logistic support to Thomas. What about Allied preparations for the war? They choose a different way. Day by day, they came closer to Dardanelles. First bombarded that side, turn back. Next day, that side, turn back. Next day, forward, forward, forward. They were planning to break the defense system before the main attack, and they mainly did. And they were mainly doing these bombardments from here to these areas. From here to these areas. Why they are choosing this part? As you see, why this part of Dardanelles? This white part helping big ships to turn back, maneuver back easily. And then the other reason, Turkish name of this part is Dark Coal. Why? It was out of Turkish cannon's range. But because Allied had long cannon distance range, from here they can easily do the bombardment, but not almost not. So, <coughs> Allied knowing that part and they using this part properly. While Ottomans trying to find something to stop them on the dark call, 6th of March evening 1915, Allied checked the Dardanelles with submarines, marked where the mines, and cleared some of them. Luckily or deliberately. One night later, Turkish forces found a solution. They dug the Dardanelles with Lusret mine lines, following this line, they came here and put here one more mine lines, the 11th mine lines, parallel to the seashore. While Ottoman putting the rebel, they were unaware that one night before the Dardanelles were checked by Allies. Also, Allies would have known that because all the mine reports saying that Darko was clear. By trusting that report, Allied had the big attack 10 days later, on the 18th of March 1915 day. It's a very special date for Turkish history. If you go to the city Çanakkale, you can see lots of shops called 18th of March Grocer, 18th of March Market, 18th of March Universe Club. What's happening? 18th of March morning, a white fleet entered the Dardanelles with 18 big... They were going with three lines, 
The first line aim was Tom the city Chinak Kale, second line the Kilit Bar, and the third line aim was clean the rest of mines, open free access for ships to sail up Istanbul easily. They breached the middle of Dardanelle easily because of cleared mine areas, also because Turkish troopers had to wait for them for good shoot. But when they were here, irresistible was shot by a Turkish mobile artillery, very bad damage, lost the control because of the currency came to Darko, hit one of the Turkish mines and sank there in three minutes with its 600 green. Second ship was Buve over here. It was shot by another Turkish mobile artillery. Very bad damage. Want to go back from where they were turning back from Darko. When it was trying to turn, hit another mine and sank there. Last one was Ocean. Ocean was one of the most powerful ship of Allied fleet. <laughs> when it wants to take the other two battleship position, it was shot by a Turkish national hero. His name was Corporal Said. I think you have seen his photo or something somewhere around here. The man with bomb shell. Have you seen it before? Okay, inside the museum, the third photo belonged to him. He is Turkish John Simpson. Later I will tell his story. After losing three ships on the Dardanelle, they understood it would be impossible for them to pass the Dardanelle without cleaning the mines, mobile arteries, they turned back and 18th of March became one of the biggest ceremony day for Turks. Every year, thousands of Turkish people coming here and celebrate the victory. 25th of April is your Anzac Day, 18th of March is Turkish Day. <coughs> okay, after six weeks later, on 25th of April morning, Allied landed six different parts of the Little Peninsula. Five of these landings occurred on the Batwa Peninsula. We call this area as Cape Palace. This area, Anzac, behind of me, that was called as Silva Bay. British soldier objective was, after that, it five the beaches. Go to Achibaba, somewhere around here. Achibaba Hill was 253 meters high from sea level. Captured this hill. They want to control Kilid Bar Plateau. Means background of two troopers and the Dardanelles and Aegis. But from the beginning till the evacuation, French and British army troops they couldn't capture Achibaba Hill. <laughs> when they couldn't, they needed some help from Anzac soldiers who were really good at trench fighting. Also, thousands of Anzac soldiers came from here to here. All the bloody fightings, they couldn't capture Achibaba Hill. All the fighting occurred in this small area. Eight and a half months, thousands of casualties from both sides. What about Anzacs? Today's subject. As all you know, Anzac means Australian and New Zealand Army Corps. Their objective was to land Brighton Beach. Brighton Beach is approximately one kilometer down there. Later I will show while we go Anzac Cove. After Brighton Beach, they would like to go up Chinookbar Hill and capture this hill. They want to control agency. Dardanelle, this part of Dardanelle. It's the most dangerous part. From here, ships could only go one by one. Distance 16 kilometers. And from Chinookbar, they want to control the Sivla Bay. Civil Bay means easy landing, embarkation, disembarkation. When we go to the high points, I will show you the Civil Bay. But first of all, Anzac soldiers landed two kilometers north of intended area. They supposed to land right now. They landed to Anzac Cove. Why? Lots of reason, lots of speculations. When we go there, I will explain you them. But after a trip to Gallipoli Peninsula, three days, three nights, without stopping day for each other. At the end of three days fightings, almost all the fightings were stopped because it became a deadlock for the both sides. To break this deadlock, they tried many plans, but the most famous one was civil operations. It was planned by Sir Ian Hamilton. Expedition Force Commander. According to his plan, while Turkish soldiers busy with Australians at Lone Pine and at Neck, behind the Lone Pine, I'll show you Neck, busy with New Zealanders over Trimbar Hill, 21,000 British soldiers would land Silva Bay and behind of the hill they will attack up Trimbar Hill. 
It was very good plan, but nothing happened as planned. When we go to NEC, I will tell you the tragic charge of Australia there and the failure of this operation. After the failure of this operation, Allied slowly, slowly start to retreat, and 19th of December evening, Anzac and British forces evacuated from Sula and Anzac with no loss of lives, and 8th of January 1916, rest of the army troops evacuated from Hellas Line again with no loss of lives. <coughs> okay, today, when you look Gallipoli campaign, you can see different different names for example one of the bloodiest war of world history why because it lasted nearly 254 days but when you look the casualties nearly 500,000 casualties it means when you calculate in one day period nearly 2,000 men 1,000 from Turkish side 1,000 from Allied side lost their lives or other name. It was the most violent war of world history. Why? Because in here, in some way, the distance between the trench lines were 8, 10 meters. Can you imagine? Let me calculate. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, I am here, you are there. I am sleeping here, you are fighting there. Hard to believe. Here, in one meter square, 6,000 bullets fall. And some of these bullets hit each other in the air. Can you imagine? Hard to believe it's the possibility of only one times in a million. But inside the museum, you will see some of the bullets hit each other. Other name, it was young soldiers fighting. We are soldiers. You have to between 19 and 45. If you're 18, the families have to sign some papers for you. But today, in our tour, you will see younger than 16, younger than 15, younger than 12, younger than 10 years old soldier boys from both sides. And the other name, maybe the most interesting name of this war was it was Gentleman's War. The bloodiest one. Most wild but gentleness for why when we go respect my match memorial I will tell the gentleness for with adding good stories from both sides. Okay now have you got any question about entering the war? We just entered. You may you spoke too much just enough. Okay, if you're not bored yet, I wanna tell one more small story. Then I'll time to go so. Okay, I wanna tell you the story of Turkish John Simpson. Carpool Sayyid, the man with bombshell. Please go back again, 18th of March 1915. After ocean ships bombardment, Corporal Sayyid fought very bad at the match. When he came to himself, he looked around and saw his friends died or should die. He wanted to do something to stop ocean going. He came near cannon, he saw cannon was okay, but the crane of the cannon was broken. Without a crane, it was impossible to lift a bomb shell. Why? Because they were nearly 275 kilograms. Boys, could you lift it together? Maybe. But he managed to lift one of these by himself. He lifted and climbed up five steps with the bomb shell, put the can prior to manage it or shoot. I know how to believe. But it was recorded by a German officer, by his wounded friends, so we sure we believe it's true. That evening, his commander wanna congratulate him by saying, Corporal Sayyid, maybe you saved one nation from this affair. So, wish, whatever you wish. He said, no, nothing. But his commander insisted on, I am ordering you to wish. You know, in the army, when your officer wants you to do something, you have to do. If not, punishment comes. He knew that. When the third time his commander insisted, he said, Okay, sir, I want one more bread for my dinner. 
Yes, we took slow and loud with the rain. But it's not about the slow the low stick. Anyway, there are times and liberation time. Everybody has one, he has two, but you couldn't eat the second one while friend eating one. Get back, Commander. Later on, the Sultan of Ottoman Empire heard about him, told him, want him to lift a bombshell again. Once more. All the photographers were ready. He said, okay, I will try. He tried, tried. I couldn't lift. Then he said, now I can't lift it. But if I see ocean ship in the Dardanelles again, I will lift it. Then they made empty the bombshell, he was the empty one, photographed the photo. So when he entered the museum, the third photo belonged to him, the photo is original, but the bombshell is not. But the empty one was also 156 kilograms. Again, hard to lift, but he lived. Okay, after war finished, he didn't accept any salary from his nation, he went to his village near the two hours east of Chanakkale and he was working in a forest, he was cutting the wood and selling them in the city. In 1939, it was a rainy day, he was turned back home from his job, it was raining heavily, he got wet and ill and died because of Thais injury. After he died, his name given to his village, Corpus Ace village, in the three half east of Chanakkale, he is Turkish John Simpson. Okay. okay, now if you're ready, you can go and visit the museum. I will give you 30 minutes, so at 2.20, please have this on the bus. Thank you. 